Um, we will get to the question of how I raise my Uber rating <laughs> at the end of this. But, um, but first, I guess, you know, big question, what, what is Uber's role in the transition to autonomous, to self-driving? You're going to own cars? You're going to build cars? What's, what's, the, what's the plan? Well, I think the, the first role that we play is to help with the autonomous ecosystem in terms of commercializing the business, right? Right now, the technology is... Uh, advancing at a substantial pace, then I think in terms of safety and establishing superhuman safety, uh, while you know a Waymo is absolutely there, some of the competition is, is starting to get there as well, there's a lot more to autonomous that needs to happen in order for it to happen at scale. Uh, you need a consistent regulatory environment, and the DOT, for example, uh, released a position that we think is a very good position, makes it you know, create some consistency on a, on a national basis. We're very much for that. Um, you need on-the-ground operations, right? You need depots and cleaning and recharging, et cetera, uh, to operate these cars on a local basis. Um, you need affordable hardware costs. Right now, these cars cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. You've got to bring them down to ten, uh, tens of thousands of dollars. And last but not least, you've got to drive utilization of these cars, because this is incredibly expensive technology and incredibly expensive uh, vehicles uh, that you've got to make profitable over a period of time. So we essentially are helping the ecosystem amongst all five of those needs. And really, uh, just like we want the best and safest human drivers on our platform on Uber, we want the best and safest robot drivers on our platform. Uh, if you're, I think you're in Austin and you took an Uber and uh, Waymo showed up. Uh, so right now in Austin, if you choose an Uber, you will get dispatched sometimes a, uh, a Waymo. Same will be true in Atlanta and, and, and in other cities you, you'll see the same. And for me, like I definitely concluded that I was, I was just to overshare, I was on my way to a funeral and had a private phone call to make about that and was like happy to be alone in the car making yes. a call to my wife. And it was definitely like a superior experience. I also just learned from you that apparently drivers don't like it when you're just like yammering on the phone the whole time, which is why I have a low Uber rating. Um, why, so why, why we think you have it might a low be something Uber else. Yeah. Um, uh, but is I mean, is autonomous basically a superior product? Are we are there base is the sort of Uber driver a temporary phenomenon? So I think if you fast forward 15, 20 years, I think eventually the cars are are going to be autonomous. And that's not just true in Uber. I think generally on the road, they, there's very strong evidence uh, to believe that robot drivers are going to be safer than human drivers. They're not going to get distracted. They're not going to get texted, et cetera. And basically, this software is learning, you know, is getting retrained every single day based on the world as it is. So they will be safer, right? And, and there are more than 30,000 fatalities, automotive fatalities in the U.S. every year. Around the world, it's more than a million. How many? How many like robot fatality? Like, I think there's a belief that people are more comfortable with human-created fatalities sure. than if a robot kills you, even if that's irrational. What's? Do you have in your head a ratio? Like, do you have to be five times safer, ten times safer? I I think it's gotta be approaching the ten x safer. You know, uh, humans understand that humans are fallible. They're not okay with software. You know, in the world of AI, being fallible or yeah. certainly. Uh, these mistakes happen on the road. So I, I do think that superhuman safety is an absolute prerogative in the business. Elon Musk thinks, or seems to think, that Tesla does not need, the Tesla can dominate the robo-taxi business without Uber. Um, and, and that you know, they have a huge brand, he has a huge distrib- you know, media network. Um, do you think that's right? Are you, how worried are you about so that? So I don't think that there will be a winner-take-all. I, it, the drama is winner-take-all, but I think that the transportation industry is a trillion-plus dollar industry. Uh, you could argue that ride share is going to be uh, finally beat personal car ownership mm-hmm. in a world where you've got robots driving all over the place. So I think there'll be plenty of room in the industry. We'd love to work with them. But I do think you're going to have multiple players. Some of them are going to go direct, and some of them are going to go through networks like ours. Do you, have, do you own a car? Uh, yeah. What kind, What is it? Uh, I have a Tesla. It, Great car. Have you tried full self-driving? Yes. What do you think of it? Uh, it is delightful, um, but I have to take over every once in a while. Uh, it is an absolutely great product, uh, and again, the car is a terrific car. 
Tesla, a bit of a meme stock, has been driving, trading between like what, like two hundred and four hundred and fifty dollars a share for a while now. I, I'm not a Wall Street quite, quite up guy, and down, so. but um, like, but 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 if what you say is true that this that basically ultimately cars are cars, that it's kind of a tough business. At what price point would you buy a share of Tesla? I have no idea. I own the car. I don't need to own the stock. <laughs> but do you, but it's I mean but. But by your theory, that company is wildly overvalued, basically. Is that what you believe? No, no, no. I, I, I'm not saying that. I, I'm just saying that there, there won't be a winner-take-all. The, the market is too large for there to be a winner take all they They're valued as though they are winner-take-all, though, basically. I think that they're valued uh, based on both autonomous and robotics, et cetera. But I'll leave up to the Wall Street analysts the value. There is this sense that Elon is like pivoting hard from cars to robots, that he's gotten a little bored with cars. Would you encourage that pivot? I, you know, I don't know... I can't speak to whether he's getting bored, bored with cars, but the um, OEM business, you know, the traditional car manufacturing business is a really, really tough business. Uh, in order to achieve scale, you really need to sell globally. Uh, and if you're going to sell globally, you're going to have to compete with the Chinese auto manufacturers. And the Chinese auto manufacturing sector uh, has made extraordinary advances over the past five to ten years. What and you partner, I think, with Pony of among the Chinese. Uh, we've announced a, we've announced a partnership with We Ride. We have uh, We Ride, which is an autonomous uh, player, terrific team. Uh, we offer We Rides now in Abu Dhabi, and we announced an expansion into into Dubai as well. But if if you are just a traditional manufacturer of cars, you will have a very very tough time, and especially EVs you will have a very difficult time competing against the Chinese EV manufacturers. I mean, people, there is a sense from anybody who comes back from China anywhere near that business, I think the tech, the, 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 the U.S. car industry and the technical term you hear used often is cooked. Um, the, I mean, is, is that your impression? Like, are we going to be France where maybe we can get some people to drive Peugeots and Renaults domestically, but, but basically it's over? Or are we going to be the Soviet Union where everybody has to drive a Lada? Cause... I... <laughs> I, I think right now, especially as it relates to EVs, right, almost 50% of Chinese cars sold are EVs. Yeah. The scale that they've achieved, the quality that they've achieved, the, the battery technology is ahead of what I've seen in the U.S. Doesn't mean the U.S. can't catch up. You know, never uh, count out the U.S., but right now the competition in EVs is extraordinary, and right now the Chinese are winning. Do you, do you think that these tariff policies, as proposed, can help the U.S. catch up? I mean, are they... Going to be effective. Well, I think the 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 com, you know tariffs uh, in some ways are designed to protect uh, local manufacturers, right? The issue with tariffs is that sometimes that protection removes the need for vicious competition, and vicious competition is like that is what gets you to be best of breed. So if the tariff policy results in companies who have it easier and rest on their laurels, no, it's not going to work. You know, then you will have, you know, call it a Peugeot, et cetera. I've got more faith in our uh, U.S. OEM partners than that. Uh, so I'm hopeful that they can use this opportunity to um, push to be as competitive as we expect the U.S. manufacturing sector to be globally. The, um, you know, obviously we're in Washington. Everybody's trying to figure out what the administration is doing. The Trump FTC recently went after Uber over a kind of pricing question. Did, did you think, you know, I should have written a bigger check to the inaugural committee or whatever? <laughs> um, it, it, honestly, that, that one was a head scratcher. It had to do with, uh, with our Uber One membership program and, and signing people up to it and, and canceling. And, and for example, there are claims that it's difficult to cancel. And like, it is, we make it incredibly easy to sign up for Uber One. The value is enormous. The, the um, renewal rates are over 90%. It's a great product. And we allow you to cancel, we allow you to pause. So we'll see, we'll get into the details, but that one was a head scratcher for me. The, um, but is there anything that makes you optimistic about, about this administration's policy, particularly toward AVs? Yeah, I, I think that um, certainly what we are seeing coming out of the Department of Transportation uh, and the idea of a more consistent regulatory framework that has safety considerations first, but then competitive considerations and thinks about kind of the global ecosystem, I think that is a reason for uh, hope. And, and I do think that 
as a as an industry, I, I do think that we have been overregulated, and not just our industry, many many industries. Yeah. So lighter, more consistent national regulatory framework across many areas is something that I think could be very very helpful. And do you think that I mean, can you give us a sense of I mean, in this, I think there, you know, it sounds you know, um, the transportation secretary was here yesterday. Yeah. Clearly, very engaged on these specific questions and, and very knowledgeable about them. Do do you um. Like, can you give us a sense of, you know, when are we going to see? Because I, you know, I just, when I was kind of blown away in Austin that I opened the Uber and got a Waymo. Like, I was very pleased. Yeah, it's awesome. I wanted to try one, but was too busy talking on my phone to download the Waymo app. Um, but the... Um, I, I hope you got a good rating from the driver. The, the robot driver. <laughs> Do they rate you too? I'm not telling. Oh, God. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, um, <laughs> but can you give us a sense of when, when we're going to see, when I'm going to be seeing experiences like that here in Washington, in New York, and you know, our, real, our big East Coast cities. That it it all depends here. on the regulatory framework. So yeah. I, I do think that you're going to see, obviously, in Austin next year, we will uh, have hundreds of Waymos available on, on Uber. And it's just a great experience. It's a delightful experience. You, yeah. you, you felt it yourself. In Atlanta, there will be uh, hundreds of Waymos as well. But the expansion really depends on the local regulatory framework. Uh, and right and, and now, I'd say and California feds, and Texas. California and Texas are the the most open market, so to speak. And you, and you don't think you don't anticipate the feds totally steamrolling the local, sort of overriding. A I, local I don't regulation. think so. That there are certain, as it relates to manufacturing standards, I think it's entirely appropriate for the federal government to step in. But you know, the the I think local regulations of of what these cities and states. Um, expect on their street. I think that should stay local. The, um, the one of the question, one of the sort of long-term questions about ur- whether certain urban areas are difficult because the pedestrians are basically so aggressive and will take advantage of automated vehicles, you know, and just walk, you know, obvi- just totally yeah, a, for- it, force. It, it's them. an elevator problem, right? You, you see doors closing, you put your hand. Yeah, exactly. Right. That, that's it's not, incredible. That's train um, behavior. Yeah. Do you think? I don't know. I mean, are, do you, is that going to be a medium-term problem in New York, or do you think norms change and we're not that bad? I, I think it is absolutely going to happen, but I think that the autonomous and AI technology that we're seeing will be able to adjust. I'm not saying that it's, it's a small problem, but you're, you will see that the, the, the AIs now are acting in much more human ways. You know, they'll, huh. they'll edge into, if, if they're taking a left turn, they'll kind of edge into yeah. the lane. There are a lot of verbal cues that human drivers get from human drivers. Right. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, visual cues, yeah. right? In addition to, to blinking, et cetera. So you will see um, autonomous drivers who drive more and more like a super like, safe like human. I once had a New York cab driver tell me that the trick when a person is walking in front of you is just to aim right at them. So that they so that they don't get confused. So maybe they'll learn these. I, uh, I don't want you I, I, I don't want you training my AI. <laughs> um, you also you know, obviously, you're, you're in the labor, you're across the labor market in a really interesting way. And I think Uber's, if there is an economic downturn, which a lot of people think will happen, you obviously, like any consumer facing company, you might use the service less. But on the other hand, if unemployment goes up, people start, start driving for Uber. Is that right? Yeah, we're, we are, uh, the way I term us is we're, we're recession resistant, which is both the revenue side and the cost side of the business flux up or down based on uh, either based on GDP. So in a weaker economy, uh, if there is more unemployment, the cost of Uber will come down because to some extent the cost of labor comes down uh, and that will keep unit volumes at a at, at decent volume. So we tend to be resistant to recessions generally. And if you look at the food category, restaurant category, groceries and transportation, in recessions, though, the, though, those categories actually suffer the least, so to speak, hmm. because they're everyday use cases. You may put off going on vacation in Europe this summer, but you're still going to treat your, uh, you know, your family out to, to a nice dinner. So these, these are, we, we specialize in small treats, not big treats. That's exactly actually what the, uh, the CEO of Philip Morris International told me this morning. Zins are apparently yeah. also part of, that, uh, part of that basket. But, but just to finish up, are you... Um, are you are you seeing anything? Are you seeing flickers of a recession in your, I guess, either in your rider data or your driver data? No, not at this point. I mean, we, um, we when I watch CNBC or when you read the paper, uh, certainly the 
perspective news is not great. Yeah. But when we look at our business, you know, the day-to-day habits of consumers around the world look pretty consistent to, uh, you know, what we've seen for the past couple of years. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it.